The historical books of the Old Testament are stories of faith and fighting, of the sacred and the sword. As the Israelites have to trust God on the one hand and battle the enemy on the other hand. We're about to embark on a fascinating journey as we see Israel moving by faith into Canaan, believing that God will give them this promised land, that it will be their land, that it will belong to their children uh, and to their descendants, that their conquest of the land is the judgment of God on the unbelief of the Canaanites and the Amorites, and it's the vindication of the promise that God made to Abraham. And then we'll see Israel trying to settle that land and get established in that land and all of the problems and difficulties difficulties that they faced along the way in the time of the judges until they finally tell Samuel the prophet, we've got to have a king. Come on, we need a king like all the nations have. And they got a king like the nations. The problem was he didn't have a heart for God. Uh, and Saul's kingdom fails. And finally, they turn to David, uh, the young man with a heart for God. And God blesses them and blesses their kingdom and launches it with the hand and the touch of God upon it. Well, the historical books are 12 in number. They take us all the way from Joshua and the time of the conquest all the way down to the time of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther uh, and the time after the Babylonian captivity. In other words, they cover about 1,000 years of Old Testament history. So we go now from the Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books of the law, into the 12 books of history. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, these are included in the section of the Bible called the prophets. You say, why? Because they were written by the prophets of God, uh, and they have the authority of prophetic inspiration behind them. Uh, but they're stories of real history, of real people in real places, of real events through which God speaks to our lives today. Now, in order to understand the books, we have to understand some things about the historical background of this period of time. And I want to do two things in this lesson. First of all, take you through a quick survey of what these books are all about, and then go back and look at who are the people and where are the places that are significant to the Old Testament story. If you can get a handle on the information in this passage of time of Scripture and of the lesson itself, you will know more about the Old Testament than the average Christian will ever know. You'll be light years ahead. Uh, and that's why when people read the Old Testament, they get so confused and they go, I, I, man, all these Hittites, Girgashites, Canaanites, who, who are these people? What in the world is going on? Because they don't know the history. They don't know the people. They don't know the places. Therefore, they don't get the point of what it's all about. Let's begin, first of all, by taking a look at the books themselves. Uh, most of them are pre-exilic. That is, they are written before the exile. Uh, write in your notes the Babylonian captivity. Uh, they come before the time that Israel was taken captive. Uh, the pre-exilic books include the book of Joshua, the story of the conquest of the promised land. The book of Judges deals with the settlement of the land. You can conquer it, but then you've got to settle it. You've got to possess the land. That became the challenge. And then 1 Samuel deals with the reign of King Saul. 2 Samuel with the reign of King David. And then the books of 1 and 2 Kings uh, deal with the kings of Israel and Judah, uh, written from the perspective of the prophets, and then in our English Bibles, First and Second Chronicles, the parallel history of those same kings. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, First and Second Chronicles, because it's not written by prophets but by priests, is included in the section called the Writings. Uh, in the third section of the Hebrew Old Testament, not that it isn't history, uh, but that because it wasn't written by the prophets, it isn't included in that section. And then there are three books of post-exilic history as well that come after the Babylonian captivity. Uh, the little book of Ezra. Uh, deals with the rebuilding of the temple. The Jews come back from the Babylonian captivity and have to build a second temple. Nehemiah deals with the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And Esther with the rescuing of the people of Israel. In those three little post-exilic books, after the Babylonian captivity, we see the Jews coming back to Jerusalem. They rebuild the temple. They rebuild the walls. 
And then Esther tells the story of the Jews that never did come back, that lay, remained dispersed throughout the ancient Babylonian and Persian empires, and yet God in his providence cares for them, protects them, sustains them, because he's protecting the line of the Messiah and keeping the promise to Abraham that eventually your son uh, will be the one that will be the ruler. Uh, that the one that will come from the tribe of Judah, the one that will come from the line of King David, will indeed sit on the throne of David. So those are the books that we're going to be examining in this section of our study of the historical books of the Old Testament. But we also need to familiarize ourselves with the historical periods of time so we understand historically what is going on during this period of time. You'll notice in your notes there is a list there under point number two of those periods. Uh, the Old Testament begins with the Canaanite period. The Canaanites from somewhere around 3000 to 2500 BC are dwelling in the land of Canaan up till 1400 to the time of the conquest. Uh, the Canaanites are, are living there in small towns and outposts and uh, little cities that then become city-states. Each town has its own king. Uh, they don't have a unified government of the land of Canaan, uh, but these ancient Canaanites are the original inhabitants of the land. Then you move to the Israelite period. Uh, under the conquest of Joshua, the judges, and then ultimately the kings of Israel from 1400 down to 586 B.C., or for about 900 years. Uh, Israel establishes herself as a nation in that promised land. Uh, then you have the Assyrian invasion in 722, in which the northern tribes are taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And then the Babylonian captivity uh, that uh, technically begins in 605 B.C., lasts for 70 years and ends in 535 B.C. Uh, when the people of Jerusalem are taken captive to ancient Babylon uh, on the Euphrates River, just 50 miles from modern-day Baghdad. And then you have the Persian period and the Greek period. Eventually, the Babylonian Empire fell to the Persians in 539, and they rule the Middle East for about 200 years, and then the Persian Empire is conquered by Alexander the Great, and the Greek Empire controls the Middle East. The period of Hellenization, of Greek culture, uh, is spreading. Uh, so that as we open the pages of the New Testament, all of this history is already past. It's already come and gone. The Canaanite period, the Israelite period, the Babylonian captivity, uh, the return of the Jews under the Persian period, uh, the Greek period that is so important in the intertestamental history, uh, in the apocryphal books, etc., and then the Roman Empire takes over. Uh, so when the New Testament opens, the Roman Empire is in charge of the world, uh, the history of the Old Testament has already passed uh, and the transition comes in the intertestamental period between the Old and the New. You say, Edna, don't lose me. I won't. If you'll hang with me, I want to try to make this period of time as simple, as understandable as we possibly can. And then I also want to help us have an introduction to the people and the places that are important in the Old Testament as well. If we're going to understand the story at all, we have to understand who was who, what were they doing, where were they located, why were they significant and important. We want to take a look at the culture and the archaeology of Israel's neighbors. Uh, you've got a, a map of them in your book I, so that you can begin to get an idea of who's where and who's doing what. Let's start with those Canaanites themselves. The original uh, native inhabitants uh, of that little land bridge between Europe, Asia, and Africa that will eventually bear the name of Israel. Uh, the Canaanite culture comes out of what archaeologists call the Middle and Late Bronze Age, in which bronze or brass uh, is the strongest metal that they have developed. Their language is a form of Northwest Semitic languages, similar to Hebrew, but not identical to Hebrew. And then the religion of the Canaanites is that which the Israelites struggle with once they get into the land. The amazing thing is they didn't go back to the 
paganism that Abraham was delivered out of. Uh, they, other than the incident with the golden calf, they didn't go back to the religion of Egypt. Uh, they learned that lesson. The tragedy is that they conquered the land of Canaan, and that's the religion that ultimately seduces them. That is the religion that eventually subverts them. They're still living in and among these ancient Canaanites, uh, and their religious practices begin to have appeal to the Israelites. It doesn't rain, so maybe we ought to pray to the rain god or pray to the sun god or pray to somebody here uh, to see if we can't uh, get things to go better in our lives. And you have the spiritual emphasis in the Old Testament. We have one God. The Lord God, you don't make an idol to represent Him. You can't uh, picture Him in any way. He is an unseen God because God is a spirit. Uh, and that spirit can be worshipped by all men that will believe in Him and trust in Him. But around them, their neighbors are worshipping idols that are representations uh, of the gods. Now, we know a little bit of what some of these people look like uh, from ancient uh, descriptions and depictions of them, etc. Uh, the uh, Canaanites were cattle herders, they uh, were brick makers, they were farmers, uh, they were shepherds, etc., uh, and their culture was just beginning to move beyond the very primitive uh, beginnings of uh, Semitic culture uh, as they were getting established in their various cities and places uh, in the Middle East. Uh, but ultimately, the culture uh, of the Canaanites was in direct opposition to that of the Israelites. There is a clash of religions, there is a clash of ethics, of values, uh, of family, of understanding of what life itself is really all about. The ancient Canaanites worshipped a, a kind of a pantheon of gods uh, and of practice of ceremonies that was the total opposite uh, of the religion of Israel. Uh, first of all, they called God by the same name, El, uh, Elohim. Uh, so they had a concept of a father God named El. But then they added to this uh, Asherah, uh, a female goddess, uh, a fertility goddess. Uh, they put up uh, little statues, Asherah poles that were depictions of her that you could pray to, to bless you with fertility, to give you children, etc. Uh, they worshiped the god Baal, the Canaanite storm god, the weather god that sent the rain. That's why Elijah the prophet will come along later uh, in a time when Israel is turning to the prophet or to the worship of Baal uh, and the false prophets of Baal and will pray that it doesn't rain for three and a half years. Oh, you worship the rain god, the storm god who sends the sun and sends the rain. Well, I'm going to pray that it doesn't rain at all, that all you get is sunshine, that, that he can't throw down the lightning bolt. In fact, I'll, I'll challenge the prophets of Baal uh, to put out a sacrifice and pray to their god that he sends down the lightning, the fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice, but he can't do it. And then I'll turn to the God Jehovah and I'll ask him to do it. I'll challenge Baal at, at the center of his supposed strength, so to speak. Uh, the God Hadad, the God of war, uh, the warrior God, from whom later some of the Syrian kings would even take their name. Uh, and the goddess Ashtar, uh, sometimes in Babylonian circles called Ishtar, the name of the Ishtar gate that led into Babylon. Uh, and uh, the Romans called Easter. Uh, we'll explain that later on. Uh, it's not that Christians have a pagan practice, but that they stole the pagan holiday away from the pagans and uh, made it a time to emphasize the resurrection of Christ. But Ashtar, uh, uh, called in the plural Ashtaroth, uh, Ashtar goddesses, Baal gods are Baalim in Hebrew, uh, O-T-H and I-M being plural endings in the Hebrew language. And then you have among the Canaanites high places. Uh, they would go up on the top of a mountain to worship God, thinking the higher up I get on the mountain, the closer I get to heaven. They don't build pyramids like they did in uh, Iraq and Babylon, which is flat. Uh, instead, you go up on a tall mountain like Mount Carmel, and there are altars to the gods Baal and the goddess Asherah and uh, Ashtar, etc., Hadad, uh, and they are worshiping the gods in these 
high places, hence the emphasis that the kings of Israel who got right with God would tear down the high places, tear down these pagan altars that were there. You also have animal sacrifice practiced by the Canaanites, but not exactly in the same way uh, that you do with the Israelites. This is always to appease the anger of the gods. Ceremonial trees that they thought the gods lived in, and so they would uh, virtually worship the trees. We also find two things that are typical of Canaanite religion from archaeological uh, excavations and what we can understand about their practices. That is the use of ecstatic tongues. Uh, they would work themselves into an emotional frenzy. They'd run and leap and jump on and off the altar. Uh, in the story of uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, they're cutting themselves, trying to bleed, hoping that the gods will hear them. Uh, and then cult prostitution was another thing that was typical of Canaanite religion. They would actually uh, convince families to give their daughters to serve at the Canaanite temples, but not as a priestess, not, not as a kind of a, of a Jewish nun, so to speak, but in Canaanite circles as a cult prostitute. Uh, people would have sex with the cult prostitute as part of their act of worship of these gods. The whole religion was all upside down and backward, if you will. It was all centered on man and man's desires uh, and pleasing himself and somehow satisfying the anger of the gods uh, as though the gods were almost like demonic forces and if I can just appease them and get them to leave me alone, life will go better. And the Israelites come in and conquer these Canaanites. Uh, disperse them temporarily from the land, but eventually taking a kind of attitude of political correctness, well, you know, we should be kind to people, and they start filtering back in pretty soon. And all of a sudden, they find themselves living in among these Canaanites, and pretty soon the idols make their way into their hands. Uh, the, the temptation is to worship their gods. Uh, to, to see if God will bless us in some way. And instead of keeping their focus on the blessor, they're only interested in the blessing. Instead of the giver, they're only interested in the gift. What can you do for me today? Uh, and, and become attracted, unfortunately, to the very religion that they had defeated under Joshua. And then other neighbors included the Philistines. Uh, some of my favorite Old Testament people. I wrote an entire book at one time on the Philistines in the Old Testament and dealt with Philistine archaeology uh, in one of my master's theses. But uh, trying to simplify it, let me just simply say, again, these are not ites. You've got Canaanites, Gergesites, Jebusites, Hittites, etc. These are Steens. That ought to tell you right there, they're different. Uh, they actually are people... Philistia is a name for the sea peoples. Uh, the Egyptians call them that in their monuments. Their culture, notice, is different. It comes out of the Iron Age. They already have the ability to make iron weapons that gives them an incredible advantage. Uh, these sea peoples migrated from ancient Greece during the Mycenaean and Minoan era. Uh, in the patriarchal stories, we have a few references to the fact that uh, Abraham encountered Philistines. Well, Bible critics go, oh my goodness, an error in the Bible. That can't possibly be the case. The Philistines didn't get there till about 1200 B.C. True. But there are evidences of Minoan uh, pottery that shows up in the Middle East. It had to get there somehow. Somebody came in a boat. Somebody landed somewhere. Uh, the people that uh, Abraham encountered were probably early Greek traders uh, that were trying to connect uh, with the people of the Middle East, and the natural place to do that would have been the land of Canaan. It's right on the Mediterranean Sea. A and then later in the Mycenaean period, uh, they begin to come in greater and greater numbers so that eventually the Philistines migrate uh, by boat uh, across the Mediterranean to Crete uh, and to Cyprus. Uh, many of them land on the coast of Israel uh, and are prominent in the stories of Samson. 
uh, and Delilah, uh, of King Saul, who was killed by the Philistines, of David, who kills the Philistine giant Goliath, etc. All of this real history, uh, real people, real places, real history in the Old Testament. There really were Philistines. Uh, some of them moved all the way down into Egypt. They became mercenaries in the Egyptian army. There are uh, remains of carvings that depict them from that period of time. We, we know exactly what they look like. They wore feathered helmets uh, that were kind of a precursor to Greek and Roman helmets later on. Uh, they carried a wide, broad sword uh, and round shields. Uh, and, and as we look at the stories uh, in the book, Books of Judges uh, and 1 Samuel in particular, we find that the Philistines are prominent in that period of time. Uh, they are the enemies uh, of the people of God. Now, they're not just Semites that have corrupted their knowledge of God, of Elohim. These are Europeans who are coming during the time of the Trojan War on to the coast of Israel that bring with them an alien culture, uh, a whole different way of looking at life and of looking at God that is totally different than anything the Israelites uh, have ever been familiar with up to that point. The Philistines captured the beach, if you will, on the Mediterranean. Then the flat farmland of the plain of Sharon or the plain of Sharon drive the Israelites up into the mountains so that by the time we get into the book of Judges, the Israelites are a mountain kingdom. The Philistines have the good farmland and they establish five key cities on the coast. A pentapolis. A pentapolis means a government of five cities. Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Gaza are all on the Mediterranean coast. Then Gath and Ekron are further inland. Now, in the biblical account, uh, there are events that take place at Ashdod, Ashkelon, at Gaza, at Gath. Goliath is the giant from Gath. Ekron is actually the largest of the five cities. It was the last one excavated by Trudy Dotan, the famous uh, Israeli uh, lady archaeologist who excavated every one of these sites uh, and who has brought Philistine culture to light so that we understand who these people were from the ancient world. Uh, the Philistines uh, were unique. First of all, they're Greeks. They're Europeans having to live now in the Middle East and trying to uh, amalgamate their culture with Middle Eastern culture. So they build pillared temples like the Greeks did. Uh, they use geometric designs in their uh, pottery, uh, similar to that of the Minoans and the Mycenaeans or the ancient Greeks. Stylized birds that are painted on the pottery, and yet from their contact with the Egyptians, they uh, develop the idea of a mummy case, but they use instead an anthropoid clay coffin. That is, it looks like a mummy case, but it's not made out of carved wood. It's made out of pottery. It's one big, giant piece of pottery, if you will, a giant jar that you bury people in, and then they depict the face of the deceased on the top of the lid of the clay coffin. So we, again, have some idea of what Philistines look like uh, from the faces that are designed on these clay coffins. Uh, in fact, uh, Mrs. Dotan found uh, uh, one uh, clay coffin that had buried in it a woman who was buried with an iron skillet with her. Apparently, she was grandma that was a great cook, uh, or else she was one wild woman that hit people with the iron skillet, but probably more likely known for her cooking, buried with her cooking utensils, uh, because these are people who, again, have an Iron Age culture. They can make iron swords, iron weapons, so that the Israelites, uh, who are still in the Bronze Age, cannot stand up against them. When we get to the story of David and Goliath, we discover he has an iron sword, he has an iron iron-tipped spear, uh, and uh, he's a man with a, uh, a whole set of weaponry all made out of iron. Why? Because he comes from an Iron Age culture that is vastly superior, at least as armor is concerned and weaponry is concerned, to that of the Israelites. Real people in real places in real history. And then in addition to the Philistines, we also understand some things about their religion. 
Part of it they borrowed from the Canaanites. Part of it was unique to themselves. Uh, they, too, worshipped the god Baal. Now, you'll notice here that Baal is depicted holding a lightning bolt in one hand and a sword in the other hand. Therefore, for Elijah to come along and challenge the god Baal, uh, worshipped by the Canaanites and the Phoenicians and the Philistines, uh, to a, a challenge that the god who answers by fire will be God, is exactly what Baal was known for, a kind of sun god, rain god, weather god that sent down the showers, that sent down the lightning bolt, and who was known for being quick to use the sword. And what does Elijah say? Uh, Kill the prophets of Baal. Put them under the sword. It all fits with what we know about the culture of the day. The one that is really unique to the Philistines is the god Dagon. Dagon is the Hebrew word for grain. Now, way back, some people tried to imagine he was sort of a half-god, half-fish with a human body in, uh, on top and a fish body on the bottom, but we now know that there are no real depictions of that anywhere, that he's really the grain god. He's the god that blesses your field, that blesses your crop, uh, that they are worshiping this grain god, Dagon, and in many of the stories in the Old Testament historical books, uh, they're encountering the worship of this god. Uh, in fact, when Samson is finally captured and delivered to the Philistines, he is grinding grain in the prison house in Gaza in submission to Dagon. We also know that they built pillared temples like the Greeks because Samson pulls the pillars off the base uh, and the temple collapses. Now, ultimately, now they were cultural bandits, if you will. They assimilated the cultures around them. Now, the unusual thing about the Philistines is that no one has ever found any literature from them. It doesn't mean they were illiterate, but there are no remains of writings that we know of of the Philistines. A few words here and there, Seiren, the lords of the Philistines, uh, a few terms now and then in the biblical account, a few names like Goliath or Goliath, uh, but in reality we know very little about these people from literary sources. We only know from the cultural remains that are left behind of buildings and temples and uh, pottery that they made and uh, the things that were part of the material culture of the Philistines, but we know it was a superior culture. Now, the Philistines were somewhat cousins to the Phoenicians north of them. The difference is that the Phoenicians had landed uh, on the coast of Lebanon far earlier and had already established themselves uh, as the seafaring merchants, if you will, uh, of the Middle East. Uh, they were called in ancient times the Purple People because they traded in purple dyes, uh, and their influence spread all the way from Lebanon to Carthage in North Africa. Uh, these were Phoenician outposts, trading posts, sea traders, who give us the alphabet. Uh, in ancient times, the Egyptians are writing in uh, hieroglyphics, uh, symbolic pictures uh, that you have to uh, interpret and explain in order to understand what it is. It's sort of a pictograph. Uh, the Babylonians and the Akkadians are writing in a cuneiform script uh, that is a syllabet uh, that you have to change uh, constantly so that you have a syllable that says alu, elu, ilu, ulu, etc. And then you, you do it for every Every combination of letters. The unique thing about the Phoenicians is they figured out how to write in an alphabet and it is apparently from them that the concept of the alphabet passes to the Hebrews who also write in, in an alphabet. So we, we know from biblical history and from the remains of cultural history found by archaeologists uh, that the Phoenicians are sea traders. Uh, who communicate in an alphabet, who try to be people basically of peace, not always, but usually, uh, who are more interested in how much money can we make off of our neighbors rather than how many can we kill, who are trying to establish by boat uh, their contact with people around the Mediterranean so that the culture of the Mediterranean world flows into the Middle East through the Phoenicians and on the coast of Israel through the Philistines. So very early on you have these Jewish people who want to worship God in truth who are dealing with the 
Philistines to the west on the coast, and the Phoenicians to the north, uh, and, and the influence of pagan culture. We'll see later in the story of history of the Old Testament that uh, Ahab uh, marries Jezebel, a Phoenician princess, uh, who is a fanatical devotee to the god Baal. Uh, who wants to use the money of the government of the northern kingdom of Israel to fund the prophets of Baal. Uh, and God raises up a true prophet, Elijah, to confront them and expose them uh, and deal with them. Uh, all of these stories are not stories that are set in some uh, vague, foggy, misty, mythical, ethereal past. They're all rooted in everything that we know about the history of the Middle East. And then in addition to the Phoenicians, these seafarers who were known for their merchant trading in boats across the Mediterranean, uh, and just as the Philistines were soldiers who crossed the Mediterranean on boats, uh, we also know that in the Middle East there were a number of neighbors of Israel as well uh, that had uh, other relationships with other nations. The Phoenicians in particular were headquartered in three cities, Byblos, Sidon, and Tyre. Now, we'll hear about the ancient city of Tyre many times in the messages of the prophets. In fact, they mention Tyre as much as they mention the ancient city of Babylon in Iraq. And then we also know that these ancient cities uh, were situated on the coast of Lebanon, uh, that they were well-developed cities with beautiful temples, fabulous merchant areas, trading areas, and ultimately they rival uh, Israel for trade because the Israelites never do seem to develop an extensive uh, sense of trade on the Mediterranean. They have a little uh, seaport at Joppa. Jonah ran down there to get on a boat to get away from God. Uh, but uh, the trade that the Israelites are doing under Solomon is in the Red Sea. Uh, the, the navy of Israel, the merchant navy going in the other direction, trading with the coast of Africa rather than the Mediterranean, probably because they simply depended on the Phoenicians to the north to bring in goods from Europe, uh, and then you could bring it right down the coast uh, from Phoenicia right into Israel, unload it at Joppa, and then bring it inland from there. We, we also know that the Phoenicians worshipped Baal, uh, that they sometimes called Baal Hadad, uh, Baalat, Adonis, and Mat, uh, the gods and the goddesses of the Phoenicians. Now, they did have a concept of sea gods, of sea monsters, uh, that uh, at times their sailors probably encountered large sea creatures and thought that these were demonic or godlike creatures that had certain powers that became part of the religious expression of the Phoenicians. But for the most part, other than the influence of Jezebel, uh, the, the encroachment of Phoenician culture in Israel is limited, at least in the biblical account. Now, it may have been extensive in the northern tribes, uh, but for the most part, in the southern kingdom of Judah, in the city of Jerusalem, there was great resistance to all of this as a pagan influence. And then across the Jordan River to the east, uh, you have the Ammonites, uh, from Amman. Amman is the name of the modern city of the capital of the nation of Jordan, the location in the Transjordan. Uh, the religion is that of the god Molech, uh, the god who is worshipped by child sacrifice. Uh, one of the uh, despicable practices of some ancient peoples where they would take a child, a baby, an infant, and lay it into the fire, uh, the, the god being depicted as sitting down and fire comes out of the lap of the statue and you throw the baby alive into the fire, burn it up as a sacrifice to uh, this god to appease his anger. Uh, we'll see a story in the book of Judges where Jephthah the judge fights the Ammonites and then he makes a vow unto God that whatever comes out of my house when I return home from battle uh, will be the Lord's or I will sacrifice it unto him and his own daughter ran out of the house uh, and uh, the question is did he sacrifice his daughter uh, as a burnt offering to the Lord 
after he had just conquered people who were known for child sacrifice? Or, or is there a better way to understand that story? And we'll see that when we get there. Uh, the Ammonites worshiping Molech, the god uh, who is depicted uh, as a kind of a bull monster, uh, half human, half animal, with the fire that shoots out from the lap or the stomach of the god, uh, all part of a pagan practice that the Israelites would encounter once they got into the land. Ammon is in the northern part of Jordan. Moab is in the central part of what today would be Jordan. Uh, its capital was Dibon. Uh, in ancient times, and there are several biblical references to Balak, the king that tried to get Balaam to curse the Israelites, uh, Eglon, the king of Moab that conquered Israel in the days of the judges, Ruth, the Moabite girl who marries Boaz and is the great-grandmother of David who has Moabite relatives. Uh, again, we see that even though God was standing against the false religion of, of these peoples, He was still offering them grace and salvation like anyone else. Uh, the Moabites worshiped the god Chemosh, also by a, a means of human sacrifice, whether it was child sacrifice or the sacrifice of, uh, of a young virgin girl uh, unto the Lord. You have these practices among Canaanites, Ammonites, Moabites uh, that run contrary to the law of Moses, to the heart of God, and Israel is not only confronted with all of this, but has to live in and among all of this and has to decide how are we going to relate to this and deal with this. Are, are we going to stand against it or are we going to embrace it and make it part of our culture as well? Uh, and then you also have the Edomites to the southern area of Jordan uh, who are established in what the book of Genesis calls Mount Seir. Remember that Edom takes its name from Esau, the brother of Jacob. Uh, Big Red himself who said, I'm moving out of here. I'm moving down to Mount Seir. I'm renaming the country after me, Edom, uh, etc. And there the ancient Edomites build a phenomenal culture carved right out of the red rock of the mountains themselves. Uh, there they, they establish their trading post at Ezin Giber in the Gulf of Aqaba down into the uh, Red Sea. Uh, later on, they're referred to as Nabataeans, uh, and uh, they build the city of Petra. Uh, you see on the screen the great library uh, that was there. Uh, you may have seen it before in the Indiana Jones movie, uh, The uh, Last Crusades, where he uh, is supposedly looking for the cup of Christ, which is really a myth. But uh, in that movie, he rides out into this obscure area and enters into this fantastic-looking building carved out out of stone, it's Petra. Uh, it's still there today. In fact, we'll see when we get to the prophets that the prophet Obadiah predicted that Edom would ultimately come under the judgment of God, that those that dwelled in the cliffs, in the mountains, would be brought down and brought low. Uh, and yet they thought to themselves, nobody will ever conquer us. The pass is too narrow that leads through the Sikh into the uh, places of Petra, uh, and uh, we can defend it easily from the invasion of an enemy army, and yet it was not an army that conquered them. Uh, the caravan route simply changed its course. Uh, they decided we're not going to keep paying the tax to go to Edom any longer. Uh, we'll go a different route. And this fabulous ancient city built in the rocks of the cliffs of Edom was abandoned. Uh, you can go on a tour to Jordan today and, of course, see what in biblical times was Ammon, Moab, and Edom. You can go into southern Jordan opposite the Dead Sea uh, and visit the city of Petra. Uh, they'll take you in on a horse or a donkey through the, the narrow passageway. It's only about 12 feet wide uh, that leads then into this fabulous opening where there are all these beautiful buildings abandoned, carved right into the rocks, uh, a fabulous culture, uh, but a people who forgot God turned their back on God and came under the judgment of God in the Old Testament. Uh, many believe that it's very possible when the book of Revelation talks about the Antichrist uh, attacking the Israelites in the last days, persecuting the Jewish people, that he drives them into the wilderness and God has a place there prepared for them to protect them. 
some speculate that they will flee to Petra uh, because there's enough water there to sustain them. There's certainly enough room and place there to sustain them, and it's very defensible against the invasion uh, of an army. Now, whether that is the place or God has another place, uh, what is obvious is this. As we look at these neighbors of ancient Israel, first of all, we want to remember these are real people. These are real countries. These are real cultures. Uh, and the Israelites dealt with them in real history. When we're reading the pages of the Bible, even if we don't know the difference between a Canaanite and a Philistine and an Ammonite and an Edomite, they're real people. They really existed. They really lived. It would be like saying today and doing a modern American, a New Yorker, and a Floridian, and a Californian, and a Texan. Uh, if you lived here, you'd understand immediately the difference, especially if you lived in one of those places. Uh, you'd immediately know the difference. They understood this in ancient times. They knew when they read the Bible, this is real history about real people, about real places. And the people that live and serve God and the people that rebel against God and the people who are blessed of God and the people who come under the judgment of God are all real people. That God is in the process of dealing with people in history just like He deals with you and me today. That He's really dealing with us where we are in the culture where we find ourselves and yet there are issues today just as important where we have to learn to stand against the culture and when the culture's wrong instead of absorbing the culture uh, the culture of child sacrifice or human sacrifice or cult prostitution or worshiping a false god etc there comes a point in which you have to say in your heart I'm not going there that's not the truth. That is not what is revealed to us in the pages of Scripture about the very heart and character and nature of God Himself. First of all, it's real history. Secondly, we have to face the fact that Israel had to make some decisions about how to deal with these cultures and with these peoples. Uh, were they going to continue to take a stand for God and the things of God? Well, we'll see in the book of Joshua, they race in, conquer the land, subjugate the Canaanites, and Joshua says what? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people make a commitment to serve God. But we'll also see when we get to the book of Judges that they soon forgot that commitment, that when that generation died off and another generation came along, their attitude was, hey, come on, live and let live. You got people with differences here. Uh, you know, political correctness says you should ought to be kind and patient and understanding with people, etc. They got their religion. We've got our religion. Uh, and pretty soon that false religion begins to get a stranglehold on the nation of Israel. It begins to choke out their spiritual life. Uh, the idolatry of the nations around them becomes all too attractive to them and the very opposite occurs uh, of what happened with Jacob when he said to his family, get rid of the strange gods. They start saying, well, a little strange God here and a little strange God there can't hurt uh, too much. We'll still worship Jehovah. We'll pray to God, the God of the Bible. But, you know, I, I need it to rain. It's been a dry summer. Maybe a little prayer to Baal wouldn't hurt. Uh, a little rain God incantation here wouldn't hurt, would it? Uh, and, and then we'll, we'll maybe pray to one of these other gods, the Asherahs, that bless your fertility. My wife can't get pregnant, we don't have any kids, we need to have kids, uh, I'll pray to the fertility goddess. And all of a sudden, the religious life of Israel ends up compromised, and the end result is they find themselves, by the end of their history, far away from God. And it reminds us today, in our countries, in our cultures, that even if you're living in a country that has a Judeo-Christian heritage as its basis of law and justice, of its foundational understanding of the family and of marriage, etc., all of that can be eroded away and lost when we do not take seriously the law of God, the commandments of God, the principles of God, the character of God, and the heart of God. As Israel forgot God more and more and more, they ceased to be the shining light on the hill to the nations of the world, uh, that the nations would run to know their God, 
would want to live like them and be like them because they saw God on display. Oh, there were times that it happened. There were times in the life of David and others when God was shouting to the nations around him that I am the one and the true God. Uh, but there were other times of spiritual compromise and confusion when they were so far away from God, the light became very dull and very dim indeed. And finally, uh, we'll see when we get to the book of Ezekiel that one day the lights went out in the Holy of Holies. The glory departed and God said, all right, that's enough. We're going to embark on a survey of the historical books and it's going to take us all the way from the conquest under Joshua uh, to the Babylonian captivity and beyond to the days of Esther. Twelve books that I hope will speak to your mind and stretch your thinking uh, so that you understand the Old Testament like you've never understood it before, but will also move your heart uh, as you see God at work in the lives of real people and realize He can be at work in my heart as well. And then ultimately that it will open our soul to understand why it is so important that the things of God are, are the primary things in our lives, that the Word of God is true and vital and essential, and that we build our lives on this truth, on a standard of, of absolute truths. Thus saith the Lord, not thus saith the culture. As we look at the books of history, God is writing a book on your life as well. God is writing your personal history, if you will. And maybe He's using this study of the Old Testament to turn us in a direction where we understand more than we've ever understood that God is God and we are not. As we get into the books, let God speak to your heart and to your life.